Welcome to the Jao Podcast, a series of conversations between writer-director Rika O'Hara, myself, composer John O'Podmore, and members of the team drawn together to create a feature film based on Lord Byron's epic poem. In this episode, we'll be talking to Athens-based production designer and art director Dimitris Tsiakis. Hi, Dimitris. We know that Byron is a significant figure in Greek culture, but are there any other aspects of the Jaor that engaged you particularly? Well, I have to say, I really love this uh, period of history where uh, the Western civilization and the Eastern civilization started getting connected again, because till then, it was just the strong colonial relationships that were formed, the Western people's opinion on the East, and nothing more. It was only merchandise. But I think that in the 7th century, 16th and 7th century, everything started changing. People getting in touch much more. And this collision is the, the exact thing that makes me love so much this period of history. It's also a little bit of a political uh, thing in there, between Greece and the Ottoman Empire. As you know, there is a long history with many, many sides, bad sides, good sides. There is a very strong cultural connection. Either Greeks or Turks uh, like to admit it, uh, which involves uh, language, music, food, clothing, and in general, culture. And uh, I just think that uh, when Byron, one of uh, the biggest, the most important Orientalists, uh, forgive him for calling him like that, uh, when he started pointing out, just before the Greek Revolution, started pointing out those cultural similarities, it was a revolution for the Western mind. I think that uh, the Western people started looking on the East with a different eye. And just because I find Byron such an important figure of the literature, I really like to think that uh, he was one of the first, very first people who put this cultural relation of uh, Greece and Turk into such a perspective. That's very interesting that you mentioned the Balkan connection, because, of course, the Balkan conflicts of the 1990s had their roots in the ethnic and cultural and religious divisions, which are also highlighted in the Jaor from uh, 200 years earlier. As those conflicts were happening right on the Greek border, how did that affect you personally, Dimitris? Well, I'll tell you the very, very personal thing about it. During that period, it so happened that I was doing my military service. I was uh, exactly on the border of uh, Greece, Albania, and Skopje. And my job was to chase and arrest, laugh if you like. It wasn't funny for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, my, my job was to chase and arrest uh, Albanian and Yugoslavian refugees. And uh, it was a tough business, but also for me, it was a cultural revelation. As a Greek, you know, Greece was always in the Western influence. The rest of the Balkan were under a very strong communist influence. Yugoslavia, Albania, all these territories were behind the Iron Curtain. So, for me, it was the very first time that I came in such a close contact with other Balkan cultures. Suddenly I realized that uh, the music was the same, yeah. the taste for food was the same, yeah. Uh, the temperament was exactly the same. <laughs> That's very reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, during the communist era, those uh, religious differences were underplayed, right? Yes, but it was very funny because as Greeks, uh, strongly influenced by Americans, by British, by the Western way of thinking uh, during the 80s and the 90s, we were uh, strongly believing that... Uh, Communists have no religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't true at all. Because all these pieces, all these remainings of religion that existed in Albania, in Yugoslavia, and in Bulgaria, later, after the fall of uh, the Iron Curtain, Muslims and Christians started becoming Muslims and Christians again. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, of course, this uh, caused a lot of uh, later conflicts, you know. I was just wondering whether, with your experience of working with refugees in the 90s, how the current refugee crisis is uh, affecting you in Athens. Well, this thing affects us all. Since ancient times, people were passing through Greece to get elsewhere, either from Europe to Asia or vice versa. Right now, believe me, it's amazing. For me, it is amazing. For the first time in history, we come in such close contact with uh, Pakistani culture, with Afghan culture, with all the bads and goods that it carries with it. And uh, for some people, of course, it's very irritating. For me, it's simply magical. I'm really, uh, I really like, you know, getting in touch with other cultures. But for Greece now, things are confusing, really confusing. You've probably heard about the rise and eventually the fall of the Golden Dawn uh, political party. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, which was expressing all the fear. Uh, it was just fear and anger of uh, the simple Greeks, of the people who didn't really know what to think about all these people that had no connection to Greeks previously. This thing is going to be bridged. This huge gap is going to be bridged. To illustrate Demetrius' point about how much Greek, Balkan and Turkish cultures share, here's an extract from the music for the Jawa, recorded with Morat Ertel and Umit Adakali. The main melody is played on an Albanian instrument, the Chifteli, accompanied with the Darbuka, a drum that appears across the entire region, including North Africa, and an electric Turkish saz. The rhythm in nine is also typical of the entire region. And I'd like to add that this was written and recorded with Bulgarian actress Lorina Kangirova in mind. Lorina sadly passed away earlier this year, so i like to dedicate this bit to a bright star. about Rumi, the poet, who was from Afghanistan but lived between Greece and Turkey, and that's how he came to be known as Rumi, because that part of the world was known as Rome to people in Asia. Exactly. It's this funny story about how names are formed, because uh, Rum, as, as you said, uh, mispronunciation of Rome. Rome, Romi, Rome, Romans exactly what uh, the Greeks of the Byzantium were calling themselves. Because, uh, as you know, Byzantium, Constantinople, Istanbul, in fact, was the Eastern Roman Empire. So everything was Roman. Uh, the laws were in Latin until the 10th century. Afterwards, everything turned to Greek. But the Greeks still wanted to show off calling themselves Romans. So Romans, Rome, Rum, Rumi. This is how and why Turks still call everything that's originated in, in Istanbul. It's called Rum. Everywhere you see this small 
the monosyllable name, it indicates a cultural connection or genetic connection with Greeks. Actually, the first time I spoke with Dimitris, he said he was wondering where he'd get the Ottoman saddles, because they are so different, they'd even change the rider's posture. I knew then that we were in good hands, but can you tell us how they are different? such a long and old horse culture in the Ottoman history. They have even written poems, issues of literature about horse riding, about uh, how to, uh, to sleep on a horse. It's amazing. Uh, if, uh, if I have the chance, I will send you some pictures from uh, this typical Ottoman saddle Zurika. Even if you don't do horse riding, you will be amazed how they look. It, it, it's very little wood in it, a lot of leather and a lot of ornaments. What actually is the uh, the difference in the posture? Do the riders look like they're sitting back or, or what do they actually appear like? Yes, they almost look like if they're laying on a saison, you know? It's crazy because they have found their way not to get tired. Uh, Jono, you have, uh, you've been on a horse, I guess. Yes, I've been on a horse, but not very successfully. And I've got <laughs> and I've got extremely long legs that kind of drag along the floor. If it's if it's not <laughs> if it's not a big enough horse, but I I'm, I can imagine. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I've uh, ridden something similar in Morocco. It was very strange for me because I do horse riding. I love horse riding. The difference is that on 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 a Western saddle you always have the feeling that you may fall if you are not careful. On an Ottoman saddle, I didn't have this fear at all. It was like uh, I could move my waist much easier around it. I thought of myself like if I had to draw a sword, it would be much easier. Well, of course, it was a little bit tiring because I wasn't used to that. And I had to raise my knees really high. In fact, it was like if I was nesting on the saddle. It changes the posture. It changes uh, the way that you stand. It changes a lot the way that you bend your back. You can move easier. But if the horse really starts galloping, if you don't know how to ride it, then you are in trouble. You don't have much control with your feet. I see. Right. So you're not grabbing the, the, the horse so much with your thighs no. and your heels. I see. No, no. So it's a very, very significant physical difference. You would look very different riding, riding in that style to in the Western style. Even the, the way of horse riding is quite different. You will see that the horses are galloping with their head down, leaving a lot of space for the warrior on their back. It's a very different thing. It's a very different thing than what you see with uh, the German knights on their huge horses. The riders on the Ottoman saddles uh, fighting very differently than what the Germans or the Teuton knights were doing. If you watch one of those crazy Mongol games with uh, the goat, it's a lot like polo, but with a dead goat. You will see that they look like centaurs. They are literally, they are glued on the horse. And one thing that's responsible for that is their, uh, their knowledge of horse riding. And the second one is the special way that they are building their saddles. You have been listening to the Gearwu podcast by the creators of the feature film based on Lord Byron's 1813 best-selling poem. I am the writer-director Rika O'Hara, and... I'm composer John O'Podmore. Rika has been joining us from Los Angeles while I'm here in London. Thank you again for listening, and look out for the next episode of the Jaor Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>